Hey, Working Preachers, this is Matt Skinner. Our fall campaign is off to an amazing start, and I'm grateful for all of the people who have stepped up to support this ministry. Your support provides new podcast episodes each week for both narrative and revised common lectionary preachers around the globe. Your gifts make an immediate impact for millions of people when biblical preaching is so desperately needed. And now we need your support during this campaign to ensure that these resources continue to be available at no cost to all of our users. A gift of $125 will provide one new podcast. Any gift to the fall campaign will unlock a free ebook titled Digital Jazz. Go to workingpreacher.org before October 31st to double your impact and have your gift matched dollar for dollar. to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast of the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this week, our reading is for October 23rd, 2022. And the texts are 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 through 5, verses 26 and 27, and then chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, as well as Psalm 51, verses 1 through 9. This selection of reading skips a whole lot of text. So uh, just as a kind of a quick overview of what's not in uh, the, what's not told in the story, but should be in the imagination uh, as we are telling this, is um, we've skipped Judges, we've skipped Ruth, we've skipped the <laughs> kingship. Um, uh, this, in fact, is the only text of David that we're going to be reading. And uh, it's it's worth noting that what you have leaning on what we talked about last week on the podcast um, is this opportunity at the end of Joshua to be in covenant relationship with God. And the judges is that kind of a falling away of that. And then yeah. Ruth is back into the covenant where in this one individual life, we see the promise of God. And so now we're going to see that promise of God in the one who has become the chosen king of God. And so now we have the story of David. And if you'll take that quick run, and I'll probably make some references back, uh, but if you take that quick run, I just have to acknowledge, I actually love the way that this reading from Samuel is cut off. It's, it's like the end of a movie episode um, because so much is riding on the last bit. And that last bit is, but the thing that David has done displeased the Lord. And it's a, a recognition right here that the promised one of God, the one that God has set up, can be disobedient and God is not going to overlook it. That's where we ended last week and that's where we begin this week. Yeah, that's really helpful. It's a it's a good um, um, thing to emphasize because we talked about that so much last week. But the 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 only thing I would add in that in between, and you you alluded to this, Joy, but just to make it just a little more explicit, and it just a few chapters before this in Second Samuel seven, God establishes another covenant, uh, this time with David, right? Um, so, you know, we had the Noah covenant, it, it, Joy, you, you mentioned a couple podcasts ago about the, um, the, cre the covenant with Adam, Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve, the Noah covenant, uh, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with, uh, at Sinai. Uh, and now this is the other major covenant, uh, in the old Testament. Um, the, the covenant with David, by the way, I got an email this is probably a couple of years ago from someone. I had, I talked about these four covenants and someone said, well, what about the covenant with Phinehas in numbers? Uh, and wow. I'm just, so I'm just adding major covenants. <laughs> with, wow, that, with, uh, that's a close reading of the text though. That is a very close reading of the text. Well, and I did appreciate person, yeah. that, but so, so I'm adding, you know, major covenant, the word major. Mm -hmm. here. Uh, the, the covenant with David is really quite astounding uh, because it, it is an unconditional covenant, and God says, "I will establish your throne forever." Right? Not, not you know, if you do this, I'll do this. But, but this is a, a unconditional covenant. Of course, in in that chapter, it says, you know, if your descendants sin against me, though I will chastise. Mm -hmm. 
them, but I will never remove my covenant from you. So this is uh, an astounding promise. And then uh, just, you know, four chapters later, David engages in whether it's rape or adultery, uh, you know, it is in the eye of the beholder, I suppose, but certainly uses his position of power to take another man's wife. Uh, um, as our commentator, Erica Dunbar says, he engages her sexually. I think that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, but, you know, at the least it's adultery. At the, uh, you know, at, at the worst it's rape. Uh, and then murders her husband. So um, the chosen one of dad does these terrible things, uh, and and so God is not pleased, as you said, that what, what David said displeased the Lord. And so the Lord sends Nathan, uh, and Nathan is, of course, a prophet, uh, and one major role of the prophet is to speak truth to power. And uh, so, and that's what Nathan does by, uh, by telling this parable uh, in, in chapter 12. Uh, and, and, he does it in such a way that that David um, implicates himself, right? <laughs> uh, because David says, "As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die." Right? The the man who took the other man's lamb, mm-hmm. and Nathan said to David, "You are the man." Right? Uh, so this is this is one of those times where um, the truth of God's law, uh, the, the truth of God's justice uh, implicates uh, this chosen one of God, uh, and he is not let off the hook. And it, it's a beautiful example of why narrative is important, because yeah. what uh, a, a narrative preaching does is to tell a story that appeals to the hearers. And that's what Nathan has done. Nathan is appealing to the justice of David, even though he has already yeah. compromised his integrity, even though he has not lived within what he professes to be a right way of life. And so it is appealing to that as as Nathan tells this story, as he narrates this situation. And it parallels because David's not even supposed to be at home. I mean, David is the yeah. one who, who's in power. It, 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 chapter uh, 11, it begins off by said, this is the time when they are at, away at war and David is not. And right. so all of this begins because David is not where he is supposed to be. And you can use that metaphorically, not just to say he is physically um, not with his army, that he is the commander in chief of, but that he is spiritually not where he is supposed to be in terms of living out the integrity of what it means to be a man of God. And as you said, in the context of this covenant, God is not going to just zap him away because God has made this continual covenant, which is what God has made with us. And, And so David hears this story, it resonates with him. Nathan could have gone all kinds of ways. You know, he could have put his finger up in his face. He could have told a story that says, now, if you had my way of seeing the world, but he doesn't, he appeals to the integrity of of David. David implicates himself. And then David's response becomes a wonderful example of how we are to respond, whether we are the lowly or the powerful, when we are confronted with our rebellion against God, our failure to walk in the image of God. And that's where we get Psalm 51. Yeah, yeah, that beautiful, beautiful Psalm that uh, um, uh, is, is attributed to David. It says, a Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Uh, we we read it. Those uh, of us in liturgical churches read it often on Ash Wednesday, which is of course you know kind of the preeminent day of penitence. But uh, it's uh, uh, appropriate to do it this Sunday as well. Uh, so we would urge you, even if you usually only do the main text, to, to include Psalm 51. But yeah, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, your chesed in Hebrew. 
according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Uh, you desire truth in the inward being. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be clean. Uh, whiter than snow, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. It's just the most beautiful uh, prayer. And I think, um, you know, David, lo lots of people don't like David. Like D David has come in for a really bad rap uh, in biblical scholarship in about the last 25 years ago or so. Uh, there's one book called something like David, uh, um, Murderer, Liar, Traitor, you know, yeah, has <laughs> all these descriptions of David. Uh, and it's true. I mean, he, he's deeply, deeply flawed uh, human being and leader. And this is, you know, uh, one of the prime examples of that. And yet, it says, the text says that David is a man after God's own heart. Well, what does that mean? I think, I think it's, this is how I read it anyway, that David being a man after God's own heart, means at least in part that when he does sin, which he does often, his heart is broken open and he is able to confess. You know, his heart is soft enough. It's not hardened like Pharaoh's yeah. heart. Uh, it, his heart is soft enough that he can, uh, he can say, you know, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, for I know my transgressions. So the, you know, the leader who is able to admit wrongdoing, right. which is so rare in leaders today, right? Yeah. Uh, they don't say, I'm sorry, they say mistakes were made, yeah. right? Yeah. But for, for a leader to say, no, I really messed up here, you know, uh, and to say that to, to, to his or her people and to God, uh, that's a rare leader and one that... that um, but you can see why why the text would say he's a man after God's own heart. Yeah. So uh, I preached this in a congregation. There was one congregation in all of my ministry where, because I was because I am a African American woman, I was removed from that congregation, and um, I chose because I couldn't preach to them. They they were twisting anything that I said to report back to my bishop to say that I was being more pointed at them than, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, in some ways they were doing exactly what David was doing. They were implementing themselves based on the words that I was preaching. I wasn't thinking yeah. about them. I was interpreting the text. And, yeah, yeah, um, I'm sorry. and so thank you. Um, uh, and, but but I'm, I'm telling this because uh, David Maines did a thing called the 50 day spiritual adventure. And it was during the season of Lent, the other time when this text is read. And he, he, he produced two sermons each week. One was a sermon that was a topical sermon and I'm a biblical preacher. So the other was a biblical text. And at the beginning of Lent, I said to God, God, I can't write a sermon for this congregation, but I have to preach. So I am going to preach the biblical sermon each of the, the eight weeks of, 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 of Lent. And mm -hmm. one of the texts was this text. And I remember reading the sermon and I remember saying to God, this is great exegesis. I could not have done this in my present mindset, but I promised you that I would preach the text that is before me, and this is the one that is in this 50-day spiritual adventure, and I preached it. Now, why am I telling you this? Because in that congregation, there was a division. There were, there were members, largely members who supported me in a small group who worked to remove me. And when I preached this text, the group that was supported of me came to me and said, Pastor, I don't know how you could preach that level of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And it causes me to look at the one who has wronged you differently. And I'm going to have to work on that. They didn't say that they had it, but they said that hearing those words caused them to say, maybe I'm going to change my relationship with the one I see as my enemy. Mm -hmm. And 
what that caused me to do is to read the story of Bathsheba after this event differently. Because if David could pray this prayer with the humility before God, I have sinned and broken my relationship with you, God. Now, wait a minute. You broke a relationship with Bathsheba. You broke a relationship yeah, right. with Uriah. You broke, a, you know, but no, yeah. ultimately I've broken a relationship with you, God, and restoring that relationship enables the rest restoration of the relationship between Bathsheba and, 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 and David. Oh my gosh. If that isn't the transforming work of the Holy Spirit right there in one of the most horrific uh, displays of abuse of power ever. I saw it in a congregation. We see it in this text. And I just want to encourage the preachers to say, God will show up in the same way in your congregations if you're faithful to the text and let the Holy Spirit do what we can't do in our own brokenness and truth telling. God can, God will, and I pray that God does.